Human eyesight has been honed in for quite a while as we ascended up the food web to our rightful place as an apex predator. Never be that one guy who said we wouldn't be predators if we weren't intelligent. Like, let's just remove an orca's ability to swim. I know I complained about that in the last video, but here we are. It was just that big of a galaxy brain take. So where was I? Ah yes, our eyes being complex enough to typically spot movement quite literally three miles away due to Earth's curvature, and that's the only thing that hinders us, because honestly the world record is 275 miles away in the Alps, our eyes are incredible organs. But they do have their limitations, which may have more to do with the actual anxiety meat within our skull's ability to process what we were seeing, versus say like the actual picking up of information. Because our eyes are so sensitive to movement, and because we are more active during the day, our eyes have adapted to light bouncing off of creatures, which are then picked up by our retinas, transported via optic nerve to the occipital lobe, where we can begin to work out what precisely we are dealing with, which would totally not work well for us concerning today's topic. Because of the visible light range that we work within, being from 380 to 700 nanometers, you know, the old Roy G. Biv, something that absorbs all this light would make it confusing to our brain to comprehend just what we are observing. A group of youngish adults, likely pre-adults in most cases, would be out on their nightly rounds to rob people because it's England and it's Tuesday, isn't it? Ugh. As they conduct their activities, something would crash down next to them, which they would immediately go after and take out because it's the British way. Upon doing so, however, this would kick off a fight for survival against creatures they could barely process seeing that may have also been struggling with the same issues concerning sensing humans. That said, these things were perfectly capable of understanding that humans were nearby if they actually tried hard enough, but only under very specific circumstances themselves. So in today's episode, let's discuss the alien physiology as well as the evolutionary history of these aliens in Attack the Block. <laughs> So before jumping into it, I want to say thank you for your support on this channel. It's me here to talk about copyright. I got hit by a South Korean company who didn't even own the copyright to a movie I covered, and it was a copyright strike, so I've been absolutely kneecapped on this site. It's been quite a good time. But by hearing this, that means you're watching this, so thank you for watching, Brometheus. Let's move on. So we kick off our story in the usual way, in the made-up land of England. <sighs> I'm really glad English people aren't real. As a meteorite flies through the sky, it's Bonfire Day, also known as Guy Fox Night, to celebrate a failed attempt to level the House of Parliament with a concussive energetic blast. Ironic that they use fireworks to celebrate it. As we meet up with a woman walking home talking on her phone, she's headed back to her flat as the streets get less and less populated before finally walking into the most sketch of areas. Walking along, there are a group of bruvs, because it's England, and uh, down the road they begin whispering to one another. They go past her and square up. The leader then robs her and takes her phone and money, as well as her ring, and pulls a force enhancer on her before shoving her to the ground. This is why you should always keep a force multiplier on yourself, because it beats force enhancer every single time. Also, this is Europe, so good luck with that. As they continue being just general douchers, stay strapped or get clapped, a meteorite comes down on a car next to them as Moses, the leader, lets her run off to then loot the car. See, I thought for sure at this point this group was just going to get totally ganked, but uh, we will come to find out, nay. As he crawls in, he gets attacked by a white creature as then he stabs it. Due to its wounds, it then runs off in a panic, and they decide to go after Dobby as they scream about round two, bruv. And this is why, in the world, there needs to be American, and then there's English. Our dialects are diverging at this point, that I wouldn't personally be surprised. In like 300 years, it may be difficult for our nations to communicate with one another. Possibly, though, because global trade and interaction online may disrupt that isolating problem. Anyhow, philosophical conversation aside, they then throw some fireworks into the shed where the creature is hiding. As it tries to run, Moses then runs in and takes the creature out along with the rest of the group. They then carry the creature out having no idea what they actually have. A pre-adult by the name of Pest then nails it on the head, calling it an alien, and it does in fact appear to be so. Not bad. Everyone usually just goes with it's probably a raccoon, but this alien raccoon has landed in the worst place imaginable for its continued existence. It landed in England, almost as bad as being sent to Brazil. However, as they gloat over their trophy in the sky, more of these things can be seen entering Earth's atmosphere and descending to the planet. Back at the Wyndham Tower, the group then takes the creature back as the rest of the group lies to their parents, talking about how it was some Gears of War stuff. Except it's coming from the sky, not, you know, under the ground, I suppose. They then meet up with a group of girls as Moses sports a pretty sick scar on his face, as then we meet up with Mayhem and Probs. Again, I have to ask, are English people even real? The science is still out on that. Finally, the cops arrive as Sam gives her report to them about who she got robbed by 
and that's the same group that then heads up to Ron's house. They put the creature up on the wall and cannot figure out what exactly to do with this. At this point, they discuss what they should do because clearly it's an alien and they can make some money off this thing. Moses asks if he can keep that thing in the plant room because it's the safest place on the block, but he's got to ask the boss first. Moses then brings the creature to High Hats as Tonks thinks it's a puppet, and High Hats begins to touch the creature's face, but he doesn't really care about it. He's more interested in hiring Moses for illicit activities. We now get some foreshadowing. A moth using pheromones. You know, the more movies I watch, the more easily I can spot this type of information being put out. You know, not just about moths, but with movies. It appears that nothing on film is typically wasted. There's always a point to it, otherwise why take the time to film it? I know, shocking revelations. Moses comes back out and tells everyone he got a job, but as he looks outside, the creatures begin raining down all over town. At this point, they hype themselves up and lock and load Brides of Christ, except it's England, so it's all close quarter force enhancers. They head back out to the park to go get the first meteorite, and as they take a look at the impression left behind by the creature, it's three times the size of the one that they took out, with large fangs and claws. Now this would satisfy the issue of these creatures traveling across space and entering atmospheres while also surviving, and it may explain the evolutionary adaptations that we see them sport later on. But for now, let's discuss this Saiyan pod and how these things show up in them. So you may find it odd that these pods would contain an impression of these creatures, or may even suggest somewhat that they create these, which would imply a certain level of sentience and even possibly sapience. But to me, it would appear it's more likened to a phase of life, which the implications on how big these creatures can actually get might be a little strange. So to me, it would seem that these creatures having terrestrial features would need to somehow get into space in the first place, but along with that, they need to secrete a tough, durable substance that would be airtight and also incredibly heat resistant, considering that they would be entering atmospheres. But is that really the case? The pod itself, much like space shuttle tile, seems to suggest that it may be actually made out of like a type of silicon, and considering we are dealing with alien life, we aren't entirely sure what they are capable of yet. This would make the most sense, however, and this would dissipate the heat quickly, whether they secrete this or it's something else, to allow the creature inside the ability to survive. So because of this, the structuring of their bodies and the shell that they are essentially in, this may mean that this is actually the young that are hatching upon hitting the ground and then being born ready to breed. If this is the case, then there are no other creatures aiding in this species dispersal amongst the stars. The next question would have to be, how would they get off world after landing on it and infesting a planet? It. Either these creatures are highly intelligent and develop a way to do so, or they have some other method that might allow them to essentially blast their young into space, or it could even be a third option. But this would suggest that the species, if the shells that they are contained within are gestational in nature, means they are oviparous, meaning that the young is produced in shells and eggs, rather than voviparous, which means life, which considering that they do have fur, it would almost seem like they're mammals, but they're not. So we'll get further into their biology here in a few moments. So they hear a screech as something was in the tower. It then takes out the dog pretty easily and then begins to move towards the group. It screeches at them with glowing fangs as the creature then gives chase. See, I told you we'd get back here in a moment. Getting a good look at these things, we can see several kind of adaptations that it would have based on where it's from. First, the creature is pitch black. Because of this, we cannot see any features on it, such as eyes, a nose, or ears, but what we can see is very obviously a mouth. As we will come to find out, these creatures tend to screech a lot, and while you cannot hear it, I can, and the screeches sound much more like an oscillation. Because of this, it can be assumed that these creatures are using sound to hunt rather than sight, which lines up with their physiology. These creatures being as dark as they are and possessing bioluminescent fangs indicates that where this species may have evolved from would likely be incredibly dark. There are other clues on its body later that will more thoroughly hint at this, but from its coloring to the light produced by its own body as well as its hunting abilities, again, this all indicates that whatever world it hails from originally, it's a dark place, but also might be blindingly bright at certain points, which is going to inspire these evolutionary traits. So as they run, the cops show up and the group breaks apart as Moses gets grabbed. For some reason, Sam is in the paddy wagon as Moses looks out and sees the creatures walking down the road, to which he says, get me in the van really fast. The rest of the group then begins to spot several of these creatures circling from the tops of buildings down into the street. The cops Hello. being outside the van start getting Hello. jumped and ripped apart quite easily. At this point, Sam goes in the back and we see these things are absolutely huge, trying to get in. The group throws some fireworks as Dennis then heads into the van and frees Moses. They begin driving the van away and head towards the garage. But before we get there, starting with the feet, we can see actually that they are walking in a digitigrade pattern, which means they're walking on the balls of their feet and their ankles are gonna be up in the air. It looks like their legs are structured digitigrade as well, with their back legs being much more stocky and then their front arms being much larger. So they kind of look like gorillas in a way. 
Now, on the tips of their hands, we know that they have three claws, which we will be able to see when it was trying to dig into the van itself. And the back claws are also there as well. These are going to be several inches in length and are very obviously going to be used in hunting patterns or possibly for defense against other types of these creatures. And who knows, with the world that they evolved on, considering how just absolutely deadly they are, it's very clearly like they could be fighting things that are even more deadly. Now, their torso and abdomen area complement each other very well, as in we see this all the time with apes on Earth. And because that their arm, their front arms are longer, this may also indicate that there is foliage back on their planet. But we will get more into their physiology here in a moment. So the group then throws fireworks as Dennis heads into the van and frees Moses. They begin driving the van away as they head towards a garage. Meanwhile, Brewis heads back to his destroyed car. I mean, to be honest with you, it's a 2002 Volvo S80 2.4 GE. So, I mean, eh, not really that big of a loss. It's no 1969 Boss 302 Mustang, I'll tell you that. Bruce then calls to Ron to tell him that there's cops everywhere. Ron then checks his binoculars and sees that there's really nothing out there. In the garage, Moses inadvertently runs into hi-hats like head-on collision, which ain't good. Dennis heads to the back of the van and tells Sam that it's aliens, but she doesn't really buy it, so she just runs off. Pest then tells Hi-Hats what's happening, but he doesn't really believe it either. They then hear a screech, as Hi-Hats finally turns around and sees that something did fall behind the car. Tonks goes to check it out as he gets grabbed and bitten in the neck. Ooh, yeah, he ain't surviving that one. Hi-Hats then takes it out so these things can bleed, so you know you can end it. So by doing so, this shows that the creatures are incredibly susceptible to damage, which means exteriorly there is no armor protecting them, or like some crazy thick skin or redundant organs keeping them alive. The reality is, much like the animals on this planet, they run by the same rules, which means we can actually glean some information from them, even if we cannot see it. First, these appear to be carbon-based organisms because they're able to convert our atmosphere, specifically the oxygen into it, into a functional form of energy. Now, there is inherently always going to be that one guy who says, well, what about nitrogen? It's roughly 70% of the atmosphere. And to that I say, no. So let's get into the chemistry on why animals don't just breathe nitrogen. First, do you find it odd that we come from here, yet we don't use nitrogen as the basis of our own metabolisms? Well, there's a really good reason for this to be the case. The nitrogen in the atmosphere is not just free floating and finding itself like a sorority girl in her early 20s. But like a sorority girl in her early 20s, it's trying to bond with anything it can. And like my view of sorority girls in their early 20s, it's great when they bond with another nitrogen because you see that's also a sorority. Okay, the joke is getting worn out. So basically when nitrogen exists within the atmosphere, it takes the N2 configuration, which is nitrogen bonded with nitrogen. Nitrogen would really like to be stable, and as stable as possible, so it fills its outer valence requirements by bonding with this other nitrogen so that it's satiated, which makes it actually incredibly stable. This, however, requires nitrogen to be triple bonded with the nitrogen next to it, which is incredibly difficult for the meat suits to actually break down, utilizing standard methods to actually get rid of bonds. So because of this, it would cost more energy than it would glean, which is why our bodies use oxygen that is not triple bonded, but instead double bonded, which then is like orders of magnitude easier to break apart to create glucose. Because of this energy requirement, it is highly unlikely any animal starting out initially as a single-celled organism millions of years prior would turn to nitrogen to be able to basically put in that energy to break a triple bond. Because of this, these creatures would very likely be oxygen-based organisms. This is further hinted at by their blood coloring, which is seen later in the movie. While difficult, their blood appears to be green in coloring, which is highly interesting. There are many parallels between the species that came from the sky and the species that reside within our own oceans. With the blood coloring, this would indicate that copper may be present indicating hemocyanin, which essentially does what iron does, or at least iron-based blood does, it transports oxygen. With their coloring of blood, how they can breathe our air, and the disruption of their own body's chemical reactions by lead being introduced to their system, which disrupts those chemical reactions, indicates that their functional metabolism is very similar to an Earth-based organism. So Moses says that they need to get back to the block as they all take off in an attempt to outrun these creatures. While going, however, they begin to get chased by them, and this causes them to split up as it's sort of like an every man for himself kind of deal, with the occasional intercession by another member. Pest then runs to the open door, but as he does, his leg gets clamped on by one of the aliens. This does a considerable amount of damage to the structural integrity of his leg. And this indicates that not only do these creatures have the ability to easily damage a person, like when they ripped apart the cops earlier, but the bite force is tremendous, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Taking him, they then pull him upstairs into Sam's apartment, and what luck, she's a nurse. They then try to text Biggs to figure out where he went and, oh man, that's right, this is 2011. He didn't have enough, like none of them had enough minutes to actually send a text. What an error that was. 
Sam then comes out armed with a guitar and tells them to leave. Pest asks her to help him as he doesn't want to lose his leg, and eventually she relents and agrees. As she checks his leg, she says that he tore a few minor ar- minor arteries! See, this is the difference in communication. <laughs> Typically, we relegate the major vessels of either arteries or veins, like you, you, if you sever those, good luck, you have about 30 seconds. Uh, sometimes less if it's like an abdominal aorta, but we would just call those, like the minor ones, blood vessels. Minor arteries sound so much worse than they actually are, but I mean, I guess it's just a matter of opinion, influenced by like geographical location, on what you call them. But just wrap it tight and stop the bleeding and stabilize the tibia and fibula in case there's a fracture. It's really that easy. So now something to know about the human leg is it is very strong because it has to be. The amount of force that we put on our legs each day just by using them to resist gravity is actually quite immense. For instance, let's say you're like a 180 pound person or 81.6 kilograms. If you were to jump down from something, say roughly three feet up, which is about a meter, and land, knowing gravity is at 9.8 meters per second per second, that would put you at about 800 joules. Taking that and applying deceleration of, I don't know, the force on your legs of 0.15 meters or about six inches, that comes out to 5,334 newtons or roughly about 12,000 pounds of force on your legs at that second or around 544 kilograms. You can start to see how forces add up quickly on our bones and yet nobody except the elderly or someone with already like having a leg injury would really care about jumping down three feet or one meter. For this creature's bite to cause micro fractures within the bone, May have more to do though with the size of the fangs than anything else as it can massively amplify the power of the bite by decreasing the surface area of where the pressure is. Again, this indicates that these creatures are incredibly dangerous but far from invincible. Actually, I would put them in the same league as like a silverback gorilla. While possessing several fangs within their mouths and even continuing back into the mouth, they appear to be as strong and dangerous as a really angry male silverback and you cannot forget about those claws so maybe they're a little more dangerous. So with bone fracture, we get an idea that these creatures have incredibly strong bite forces, but what are with the fangs? That's an excellent question. These fangs show several things. First, these creatures are absolutely predatory given their drive to run after prey. They can emit a form of echolocation from their mouths that they then can track, which would indicate they do have some sort of organ that can detect bouncing sound waves, which is why Biggs in the trash can, like the thing can hear him, but it doesn't know where he is as all it sees is a trash can and not a human. So you may be inclined to think because of my previous comparison to these creatures, they may just eat like a silverback gorilla as well, considering gorillas have fangs, but gorillas also have masticating teeth meant to break down fibrous plant materials. These fangs can also be used for like protection or intimidation. These creatures, however, have no masticating molar teeth to speak of. Instead, they have fangs everywhere. This is a purely carnivorous species and whatever it is that they have to hunt or are evolved to hunt, it would appear to me that it is a difficult species to come by. We see similar setups in the deep sea actually, like way down there. Fish that have evolved have specialized secondary jaws and extra teeth that curl inward because if they get a hold of something, they need to hold onto it for dear life because they don't know when another chance at food is going to come by. Because of this adaptation, this continues to support the idea that the planet they are formed from is incredibly dark, but may have also other characteristics about it that would put environmental pressures on this particular animal. So at this point, Dramon recognizes her and he asks her how long she's been on the block. She says a few months, but she's thinking about moving already because she doesn't like the area. Bewildered, they ask why, which y'all literally just got done robbing her less than like two hours ago. I mean, why would she want to stay? So they get ultra butthurt over this and then they hear something hit the door. Moses goes to check it out and here's aliens. He closes a weird secondary door. I'm not really sure why there are two doors there, but then the creatures break through anyways, cause it doesn't matter. Moses is able to hit it in the head with a blade as he studied that while you were chasing vanity and confirms to Sam that these things are in fact aliens. They begin checking out its body and remark that it's actually too dark to even see. Literally the limitations of human eyesight, which we actually have a version of this, which let's get into what this is and why would it be excellent to be used for these creatures purposes. There is a color out there that describes the way this creature looks perfectly and it's called Vanta Black. This version of black is so black that it absorbs almost all visible light and that makes it incredibly difficult for our brains to work out what we're actually looking at because no visible information is coming in from that section of vision. See, here's what the interesting thing about our brains and vision is. It's basically all made up. Our brains like to do a little bit of trolling, so to speak. 
So let me explain, as I have personal experience with the limitations of seeing and how the brain just fills in information as it sees fit. When I get migraines, it starts simply enough, a small dead pixel basically centered my vision. However, if I were to look at words or faces, I can't actually see them. It sounds horrific, but really it's more annoying than anything because it ensures that for the next four hours, my brain is gonna hurt. And for the next three days, my emotions are going to be rather annoying. Being made of meat is actually, well, it kind of blows sometimes. <laughs> Anyhow, let's say that you're looking at a Word document. You have all the words written all over, and then a blob will appear, not in the center of your vision, but just around it. In that blob, for me personally, I will see that the document is there, but the words will be missing. The reason the words are missing is because the migraine aura has screwed up communication and deciphering of that information, which means the brain has no idea what is actually supposed to be there, so it starts making it up. It's trying to complete the picture and show me that there is something there by using clues around it, and that's what I'm seeing. But when it comes to the finer information like words, those are completely missing. If my brain didn't try to do this, it would just be a black spot in my vision because it's not interpreting anything. Vanta Black does something very similar. Because there is literally no cone or rod activation, or at least very little, our brain becomes confused as to what we were actually looking at, which can cause feelings of uneasiness in people. In fact, some people get really anxious just by looking at Vanta Black because it seems unnatural. This unsettling feeling is caused by your brain knowing that something is there, but it cannot quite piece together what it is. In fact, there is a short story about essentially just this, which is like a portal actually, but it's Vanta Black, and then this thing pops up and you gotta keep looking at it, otherwise it'll keep crawling out and then take you out. It's kind of an interesting one but it's absolutely wild just how dark this color is. So now why would these creatures actually want to Vanta Black themselves? To me, it all goes back to hunting and likely the orbital pattern of their initial world that they evolved on. So first let's put together all of these clues. These creatures when born are sealed in an incredibly durable shell that can resist heat. After being hatched, their hair is a form of Vanta Black, making it difficult to see them, but they also have the added benefit of protecting their genetic material from being damaged by UV radiation. If you didn't know pigmentation, that's literally the whole purpose of it. That's why if you go closer to the equator, people will have darker skin, whereas higher to the north and south, they have lighter skin. And on top of this, after they take out the creature, they can see that this coloring is due to hair on their bodies, as mentioned, and coupled with this, they sport bioluminescence and hunt by echolocation. This planet, in my mind, would have to be a highly elliptical orbit because as the planet oscillates between heading closer and closer to the sun, known as the perihelion, the Vanta Black coloring would protect their genetic information from being destroyed by UV light creating cancers. This allows for the adults to exist in the sunlight that is likely extremely powerful, and with that, the hair also provides a layer of insulation from the heat likely brought on by existing on the surface. As the planet begins to swing back out to the further reaches of the solar system, the light would begin to dim and the world would get colder. The fur would then provide the insulation, as mentioned earlier, keeping them warm, and likely during the furthest point from the sun, known as the aphelion, the light may be so dim that this causes night to be abysmally dark and the day to just be dimly lit or possibly not even at all. Hunting by echolocation would be paramount to their success, but this is also likely when breeding would take place depending on the planet's orbital period. The fangs may be an indicator that a male is ready to breed, so a bioluminescence is produced to signal to females, whereas females will exude a pheromone that when Moses attacked the female, he got covered in it, so it appears to be either gland-based or the blood itself as it makes its way to the surface, sort of like the pheromone making its way to the surface. This is like how water in the blood eventually can become sweat by the ducts in the skin being hydrated. It's that type of deal. When it's cold, possibly heading back towards the sun, this could be a behavioral pattern that could be triggered by like the sun becoming larger. Eggs would be laid on the surface and they would need a way to deal with the heat of the sun and how it would put that on them. The silicon material could withstand this heat and the creatures then could go on to hatch after the perihelion time frame when they then would head in towards the aphelion and maybe it could be considered like their autumn so to speak which then they breed and repeat the process. Now the question I will answer in a moment though is how do they even get into space in the first place? So while all this is going on Sam has noped out of the room. As she walks, she hears screeches and decides to rejoin the group because, uh, screw that. They then tell her that she's gonna need a way to defend herself as then they head out. At this point, Hi-Hats has called in backup and force multipliers. He tells them about what's happening as he continues to listen to his own music. 
Okay, that's a little self-absorbed. The group then decides to head up to their friend's flat as Biggs is trapped in a trash can by one of the creatures. It knows that he's in there, it just doesn't know how to actually get in. He calls the girls as they can't understand him, so they just kind of give up on that. While that's happening, Probs Mayhem show up as Moses tells them to go home. They head up to the flat and then close the security gate. As they look out from the top of the flat, they can see this must just be localized to only this area because the rest of the city isn't freaking out. Moses at this point has a fear. He believes that these creatures were sent by the feds to take everyone out as they don't care, which is why the cops aren't looking into this area. I mean, this is the government. You never really know, but these things did fall from space, so <laughs> I don't know, man. But the girls laugh as this is ridiculous as Tia then opens the window and looks scared. Panning out, we see there's a lot of creatures out there. Didis goes to take one out with a force multiplier, but it's actually a force divider, if I'm being completely honest. He has his helmet on as one takes a bite, and good lord... It literally tears his head off the hard way. Ouch. You would be feeling every bit of that. Which, let's get into what happens with that, as well as, you know, the morbid curiosity that is associated with this channel. Don't lie. You know that you have one. If you ever got your head torn off, right? The first thing is, it might actually feel a little good feeling that decompression at first, but uh, as that happens, eventually your skin would begin to stretch. You'd feel burning. The muscle would begin to stretch. Also severe burning. And any nerves would start to get torn away. Now, that whole area would feel like it's likely on fire, but once it started getting to the actual spinal cord tearing apart, that's when your entire body would be going into shock. It would likely render you unconscious, and in general, it would not feel very good. It would feel like, well, basically you're being pulled apart, which is incredibly painful. Think of it like a trillion ants biting you all at once inside of every piece of meat that you have, whether it be muscle, bone, which that's not meat, but whatever, or your spinal cord itself. Basically, it's gonna hurt a lot. So this creature now begins looking around the room for Moses, but then ignores the girls. To me, this indicates that while they possess an organ that can help them locate, they still would likely have a sense of smell that would help them in locating a female, as they are unfamiliar with the human scent, so they just kind of ignore you. So by not using echolocation, they do have difficulty tracking humans. Tia attacks it with a broken lamp as Moses gets his blade stuck in a wall, but Sam takes it out before it can make him befall the same fate that Dennis just had to deal with, which was horrible. Hi-Hats at this point questions Probs and Mayhem to learn where everyone went as they realize it's going after Moses and Dennis just sort of got in the way. Hi-Hats comes out of the elevator at this point firing randomly as he misses literally every shot. And one of the aliens was there and again he misses every shot. So this is the importance of going to an actual range from time to time. You know, hone your skills. But the alien then backtracks them into the elevator as all of them are now stuck with that thing in there getting torn to shreds. Hmm, tough break. Biggs continues to call that the feds are in the area and they have it on lockdown and that he's gonna make a break for it. Though as he does, the creature immediately attacks the trash can and it looks like he's stuck in there as uh, he was able to basically spot the trash can lid moving via echolocation. Bruce at this point then heads to the elevator, completely unaware of what's happening as the elevator opens up and Hi-Hats somehow survive the actual elevator brawl. The rest of the group joins Bruce in the elevator heading up to floor 19. As Probs and Mayhem look outside at the block, it's crawling with aliens, quite literally. As they exit the elevator, they launch some fireworks to scare the creatures, which I can only assume, given their propensity to react to loud noises and fear, that either this greatly affects their echolocation organ, or they do in fact have some sort of ears that can interpret regular sounds around them. As Moses goes around the corner, for some reason the lights begin going out. They appear to be possibly on timers. They continue smoking out the area as the creatures then come for Jerome, who's now lost in the smoke. He loses his blade and then gets attacked by one of the creatures, but as his friend goes back for him, his head gets bitten in what appears to be quite the bite force, and the human skull is never really supposed to deal with those forces. Now, we do not know if the force to crush the skull was completely imparted, but as mentioned, force applied over a small area can greatly increase it. So by doing this, it could definitely pierce the skull, taking out pretty much Jerome, which, uh... That sucks, so then the group runs and goes to Ron's flat. Hi-Hats is in there, who clearly cannot read a situation for some reason, that they are all under attack. In the window behind Hi-Hats, a bunch of creatures now arrived, as he's completely torn apart face first. That hurts. So if you wanna see the uncensored version of that, I do have a rumble where I upload these without blurs. Meanwhile, in the plant room, the creature appears to have started to like grow some sort of material on it. Moses laments over his decision to take the creature out and bring this upon everyone. As Moses then goes to look at the creature, he realizes the blood of this thing is actually glowing in the light, and it's on him, which gives Bruce an idea. The creatures may be hunting Moses because of the pheromones in its blood is on his jacket. You see, the moth pheromones from earlier made sense. Which, what are pheromones? I mentioned pheromones a few times, but essentially it is like a scent. It helps species of the same species identify when, say, like a male or female is ready to breed, or if they're not. 
because animals do not have communications like humans do, this is their main way of learning about one another, that and their behaviors. One of the funny things that people claim is human pheromones are a thing, but the reality is it's not true. Humans do not communicate via pheromones because the organ associated with it is essentially deactivated in humans and non-functional. A lot of people assume their scent, like their armpits are pheromones. No, bro, that's just bacteria producing that smell. Go shower. There's a lot of bro science kind of pointing to pheromones being a thing, but really, as a bro and a former scientist, we do not really find any evidence, at least from what I have read and seen that pheromones in humans can actually influence anybody or it was really how we communicate. Instead, we just sort of ask and speak, which is the best way to reproduce that I have found. So these creatures, however, are animals, and as such, they need to communicate through pheromones and visual signals, such as glowing fangs. This, in turn, is supported by their propensity to chase a female, no matter her location, by being attracted by the pheromones that she produced, which led them to basically be a homing missile on the group. So essentially, by Moses inadvertently taking out the female, those attacking are males. This means that due to those pheromones, that he is essentially the female, and when discovering that he isn't, they get a little upsetty. Meanwhile, out of the dumpster, Probs and Mayhem are able to free Biggs by igniting the creature. Fire is very effective. They now jump in the dumpster because their other natural enemy of this group, the cops, have finally arrived. So a plan is hashed out back in the plant room. They change clothes and Moses hands Sam's ring back to her. Sam heads out as Ron tells her good luck and then shuts the door. As she moves through though, they cannot see her because they do not appear to be using echolocation at this point in time to spot her and they do not appear to really smell her either, perhaps overwhelmed by the scent of their species female nearby. Sam then heads into Moses' apartment as she gets the apartment ready to blow so Moses can confront these creatures. He straps the female to his back and then runs out as the creatures identify him pretty quickly. Running for his apartment, he ditches the female at the front as they all run in, and then he lights fireworks as he then blows the apartment. And that would leave your ears ringing like terribly. Ask me how I know, it being right after the 4th of July. Somehow he ends up almost going outside of the window as then the rest of the group tries to go and get him, but SWAT, or the English version of SWAT, has officially arrived. What a timely rescue. They begin arresting everyone involved. What a timely rescue. And in the scuffle, they start yelling about an alien invasion. They try to tell the cops that Moses saved them, and then Sam tells them that, oh, those boys over there protected me as everyone starts chanting Moses. And then it cuts. And it's been about 12 years since this came out, which Attack the Block 2 was confirmed to be in the works in 2021, but it's 2023 and we still haven't heard anything as of yet. Also, one of the searches on Google is, is Attack the Block based on a true story? Bro, I mean, good lord. So this leaves one last question. How exactly did the species get into space in the first place? I see two options. It is made known, which it's just a hypothesis, that the species could travel the solar winds and infest a planet, which is why they're on Earth. But I see several issues with this. First, how exactly are they getting off world after continuing to ride the solar winds and landing on a planet? For this to be a possibility, this would require them to be highly intelligent, like spacefaring intelligent, or for their species to grow to immense size and literally blast young off the planet. However, for a creature to get that large, it would violate the square cube law, which basically means that animals can only get so large before their tissue that they are made of would not be able to deal with moving the amount of tissue for their own bodies. With this major issue highlighted, I do not believe they are a species that moves from planet to planet, as made mention by riding solar waves. Instead, I think something happened to their planet. With highly elliptical orbits, that creates a lot of issues. First, the asteroid belts typically like to form within solar systems in bands. Second, elliptical orbits put a lot of pressure on a planet by changing gravitational forces, turning it into like an accordion almost. I believe because of this, whatever planet these creatures are from, if their planet orbits in this highly elliptical orbit, it may have been hit by either a large asteroid or their planet was shredded. Upon this happening, obviously the heat would be immense, which may indicate this is quite literally a possible learned behavior if the planet wasn't shredded. If silicone eggs are intentional to deal with the sun, it may be that the planet is tidally locked, and when swinging back in towards the sun, asteroids will hit one side of the planet. Upon doing so, eggs would be ejected off the planet, which is how these creatures spread, which may hint at a migratory pattern from one side of the planet 
to the other to lay these eggs for annual asteroid impacts. On the other hand, this may have just been a species not tidally locked to the sun and got hit with a big enough asteroid to sterilize its surface but blast these creatures into space who were then awoken by the heat generated by entering Earth's atmosphere. The other option is the planet was shredded, which is always a possibility as it may have been like a decaying orbit that after life formed continued to devolve. For instance, Earth's moon will eventually leave orbiting Earth and Earth will continue to slow its spin. Planets are still quite dynamic and if this is the case, the only ones that would have survived are the young and their eggs. The rest would have been destroyed by the vacuum of space or the heat generated from the planet's destruction. This in turn meant that the ones that ended up on Earth just got incredibly lucky for like landing there, but then they landed in England. Again, tough break. This would help to explain how they actually got off world because any animal that would be able to blast them off world wouldn't physically exist due to the limitations of physics itself and tissue strength. But anyhow, I wanna hear what you guys think. How do these things end up in space? Let me know in the comments. I don't know if this felt like it was all over the place. It did for me because I'm very tired. It's the end of 4th of July week and I have been grinding it out this whole time. I'm ready to take a nap. Uh, if you enjoyed, leaving a like is always appreciated as it helps get the video out there and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links in the description for all those interested. And over on Roanoke Tales, we actually talked about the radiation that was left behind in the Reynoldsham Forest incident. It's a pretty interesting one. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, as always, a huge thank you to my boy Death Dancer at the Astrophysics tier. Thank you, sir. I'd also like to thank our scientists, Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satome, and Tyson Nakanishi. Thank you as well. And the rest of my patrons, I appreciate you guys. You don't have to help out, but you do, so thank you. But I hope everyone enjoyed. That's going to do it for me, and I will see y'all in the next one.